Why are you running for office? Why am I running for office? Um, many, many reasons. Um, I would say that uh, throughout the course of my life, I have been deeply and profoundly impacted by faulty political decisions. And most of the time, I would uh, channel those situations into times where I would volunteer and help others. But it wasn't until um, 2018, I unfortunately got ovarian cancer. And I'm completely, completely well now. But during that time, I thought I would never be a person to say this. I have health insurance, always have. Um, I recognized firsthand how incredibly awful our healthcare system is. And um, I said, if I lived through that, I was not going to just be a volunteer. I was going to make some changes occur because I would not want my daughter or anyone else's daughter or mother or sister or any other person that's impacted by health care to have to go through some of the things that I went through. So I've always been politically active, um, had planned on running at some point in time, but uh, it really kind of sped up the process, that experience that I had. So that's why I'm running, to make change. <clears throat> so what is it about, uh, specifically, from your experience in the health care problems that you as a legislator could influence changes? Um, well, there's only so many things I can do on the state level, right, because it's, it's a federal issue as well. But um, for one, we need to get the dialogue about women's health care uh, abortion is not women's health care. Cancer is women's health care. Um, preventative medicine is women's health care. All these different things. Um, there's so many things we can do for women to improve that. Um, on the federal level, I mean, you know, if we can get things done where we can purchase insurance across state lines, which would be a big cha game changer, that would be great. But on the state level, I'd like to um, do a lot of things to um, increase awareness, for one, on, on actual real problems in, in women's health care. As you talk to voters in your campaign, what are the hot button issues that they're talking about? Um, overwhelmingly, I, I will say I live downtown. So a lot of people that I speak to downtown, yeah, I mean, and, and, and I would say in the district in general, but um, homelessness, uh, it's constantly on their mind. Homelessness is the number one issue that I hear quite a bit. <clears throat> and you're a downtown business owner? Yeah, I, I sold my business, oh, FYI, uh, yes, in August of last year. Oh, okay. And that was intended um, with the whole cancer, I'm like I said, I'm completely well. But I, in addition to wanting to get involved in politics, I said I only wanted to do things that I'm passionate about from this moment in time for the rest of my life. And um, that the business had run its course. I wanted to move on and do other things. I enjoy buying investment properties, and I already own some investment properties. So I got a real estate. I got a license to sell real estate, and I'm working with under a broker. So that's what I'm doing. I sold the business in August. People who live and work downtown talk, like you were saying, talk about homelessness. What can the state uh, and the city do <clears throat> policy-wise to address homelessness? Or what should they do? Um, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of these people have mental health issues. That, that's, we, un I understand that. So what can we do? There's, there's a lot of different things we can do. Um, in my research and talking to different people, um, it's never going to work just getting these people in a property, so to speak, in housing. They need access to mental health. And I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of Haven for Hope in San Antonio. They are not funded anymore, really, by um, uh, this, the city or anyone else. It's nonprofit, um, and they get, their, they get their donations privately, I think, since 2011, if, um, if I recall correctly. 
And they have their, you know, I don't know if any of you have been there, they're on the outskirt, outskirts of San Antonio. And it is a place where these people get everything they need. They get mental access to mental health, they get a warm bed, they get a meal, they get some job training. Um, it's all encompassing. We're going to have to do things like that in order to solve this problem. And, um, you know, there's a couple of things. I think one of the things I've, I've questioned and, and suggested, I'll probably show my age here. Um, many years ago, there was a program uh, called Job Training Partnership Act. I don't know if any of you recall that. Um, I think when Clinton went into office, he uh, rescinded that program. But I remember I had first moved to Texas when I started using that program. It was a, I thought it was a great program. Um, I was living on the border when I first moved uh, to Texas in 87, actually, and uh, in McAllen. I spent many years along the border, um, about 20 years. That's where I was married. We had a chain of Domino's pizza stores along the border, and uh, my, uh, my daughter graduated high school there. And that program... Uh, was a partnership. It was between, um, you know, a business would uh, register as a partner and potential employees would go in there and sign up to be a part of the program. And what it did was, um, it was for, you know, higher risk type people. Uh, it offset some of the costs of training new hires, more of your high risk people. Uh, the government would reimburse, I believe it was 50% of the training wages. I, and I think it was either during six weeks or eight weeks. I can't remember the exact number right now. But um, it worked well. I never really understood why it was um, uh, done away with. But if we could get a state version of that, I think that's something to look at. Um, I went to a, a mental health, a NAMI meeting this past week. And these are people with mental health issues. and and. Um, they were talking about the clubhouse and he was saying one of their biggest barriers is trying to get these people employed. I know myself as a business owner, I utilized that many, many times. It's not going to be something that can work with all industries, but it can work with hospitality, food service, construction, have, pe have these business people, they'll absorb some of the cost because one of the biggest expenses in hiring someone is training them and when you when they quit quickly which in the food service that happens a lot um, you don't recoup a lot of that money it's down the drain and then you have to go and hire someone and train them again well a business owner I think a lot of business owners would be willing to take that risk hiring someone who has just gotten clean and sober who has had some mental health issues they'd be willing to um, take that risk on them knowing that they're going to get reimbursed for part of those training wages. So I think that's one thing we can do to employ them. Could you talk a little bit about your views on gun safety and, uh, well? Absolutely. I am extremely pro-Second Amendment. And I will tell you why I'm extremely pro-Second Amendment. When I was living down on the border in 1994, uh, I had no idea I had a stalker. I woke up one morning and there was a, a man sitting down next to my bed staring at me and proceeded to try to rape me. I fought for 30 minutes for my life. 30 minutes is a long time to fight for your life. And I know there was a clock in my room. Um, I only got away because I'm extremely physically strong. I've been a competitive bodybuilder. and. His finger got in my mouth and I swore I would bite it off. And with his blood gushing in my mouth, he finally released me. And without hesitating and looking back, I ran outside the front door to the park and joggers rescued me. Gave me PTSD for 25 years. I bought my first gun after that. And I will never allow anybody to tell me whether or not I can defend myself. Would you support any uh, uh, reforms, such as the background checks uh, reform or uh, red flag laws? 
So the background check reform, you're referring to um, right now, if you purchase a gun from, say you and I go to an alley and you wanna buy a gun from me, I don't have to do a background check. There's no gun show loophole, okay? That word is thrown out there and it's, it's nonsense. There's not a gun show loophole. The law currently states if you buy a gun from a private citizen, I don't have to do a background check on you, okay? If you buy a gun from, an, from a licensed dealer, he does a background check on you. I mean, you can buy a car. I could sell you a car, and I don't have to do any, any background on you. I simply sell you the car. Would I support that? I really don't have a problem with it, but I will say it's not going to solve the problem because someone that wants to do harm to somebody will find another means. And you have to look at it from the perspective of the potential criminal. Most crimes with guns are committed with guns that are stolen, okay? Yes, there's a few outliers out there, um, but having said that, they're usually a stolen gun. Well, if you think about it, let's say somebody wants to rape me or break into my home, whatever it is they're going to do. Do you think for a moment that they're going to pause and say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to do that to her because I have to go to the licensed gun dealer and purchase a gun and they're not going to let me. Oh, scratch that idea. What they're going to do is, we all know the drug war doesn't work, they're going to find someone and buy a gun on the black market because they're already criminals. They don't mind breaking the law. That's what they do. So we can do that, we can change that law, but it won't solve the problem. Red flag laws, I, having been someone that's attacked and been the victim of a little bit of domestic violence, I don't think these people should have a gun. I've been in fearful at times. It's something I'm open to, but very cautiously because we don't want it to be used and be out of control. We don't want to take guns away from just everybody and then it becomes this slippery slope where, okay, well, this reason is good, this reason is good. I would be willing to look at it, um, but at the end of the day, I'm not for restricting law-abiding citizens from having a gun. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so many of the issues you spoke to are ones that we hear more often mentioned by Democratic candidates. Um, where do you see yourself fitting into the ledge? Like who, who are there legislators that you look to as saying, um, I think I will sort of fit in with uh, that person or that person and not this group. Well, I tell you, the one thing I always like when people ask me about myself, I always say, I, I never want to be put into a box, okay? I'm me. Unfortunately, when running for a political office, I have to pick a team. <laughs> I don't like that I have to pick a team, but I do. Um, I would like to think of myself as someone that gets along with everybody because I'm usually willing to compromise. Not on principle, but I'm willing to make concessions because at the end of the day, collaborative effort is what it takes to get things done. You can't even, let's look at a marriage. If two people stay headstrong, you'll never be able to amic amicably stay together. It's just not going to happen. It's the same way with everything in life, okay? Um, I have my beliefs. If someone can enlighten me, I'm certainly open to being enlightened. But I don't want to say that I'm looking to anybody. I, I, I'm looking to get along. I'm looking to change things. But I'm not, I don't want to be put into any sort of box. Um, I lean Republican because certain things I do believe in. There's some people that have literally asked me, why aren't you running as a Democrat? <laughs> um, <clears throat> It's because uh, I am very fiscally conservative in my views and certain things I just won't budge on. 
Um, but I'm socially liberal. I think we should respect and um, embrace everyone, um, give them equal treatment, uh, recognize that some people need a helping hand, but um, generally speaking, I'm, I'm fiscally a conservative person. Do you believe the current state and local <laughs> tax system is fair and equitable? I do, yes. The top, top income earners pay, what, about 50% of taxes in this, in this country? What about in the state? There's no income tax here, obviously. Uh, in the state? Right. You're asking me? We depend me? heavily on sales tax and uh, oil and gas tax. As part of the result of that, we have what a lot of people consider as very high property tax, despite efforts in the legislature past three sessions, I guess. Most people think property tax is kind of onerous. Oh, I think, I think property taxes here are, are, you know, high, and they continue to go up. I own properties. I own investment properties. I, in my investment properties, I can't um, raise my rents in line with what the percentage increase in the property taxes are. I just can't do it, or I'm not gonna have. I'm gonna have vacant properties. What's the solution? What's the solution? I have some thoughts. I, you know, um, think out loud. All right, I'd be happy to share them. I love uh, thinking out loud. Um, Here's what I, I question. Why have we not, um, you know, uh, property use is changing. Malls are no longer going to be in existence pretty soon here. We have mixed use properties, right? The domain is a very successful uh, um, example of that. So my thoughts are property uh, taxes, the biggest percentage of them come from school taxes. Why don't we try high school campuses only and in underserved areas too, some area that, you know, these, yeah, these high school kids don't get exposed to tech and various things, build school campuses as mixed use. No, I don't mean a McDonald's. I mean well thought out office space where there's a Google there maybe, an IBM, an Apple, and these high school students are going to get internships, apprenticeships, exposure to tech that they might not have otherwise been exposed to. And so now you have a property, and so you can do this in, in various ways. You could do, uh, you know, where the, the building is built and you do a lease back. You could do it where both parties absorb some of the cost, or you could do it where we basically, Google and, and those other companies pay rent. So now you have a profit center as opposed to something that's just bleeding everyone. And you don't have to raise taxes because you're, you're generating some revenue. You could do things like it's office space, so put some um, mental health care people in there. And um, now these children have close access to mental health care providers. I mean, I know the state, um, they allocated some of that in the school budget, I believe, because we really recognize that mental health is a big problem that we need to address, especially for high school uh, young kids. So on the property tax thing, last session, the <coughs> ledge uh, lowered the cap uh, on mm -hmm. property tax increases. Cities like the one you would be uh, representing uh, fought that uh, and lost. Um, would you have, if you, the city of Austin had come to you and said, hey, we're against this thing, uh, but on the other side, it would limit future property tax increases, where would you have voted on the, the legislation? I would have suggested what I just outlined for you, because it would mitigate, offset those costs. But if we're... If we're that's my we're, only we're option, the, we're in the house chamber. And we're okay. Little, uh, so, what, are you asking me? Or whatever it was. Yeah. Am I for a ca I'm for a cap on property taxes for sure. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, or the lower, you know, the cap that was yeah. the three and a half percent. What are we yeah. People can only afford so much. At some point, you know, it's going to severely impact. Does the legislature spend too much time on, uh, I'll say, far right social? views uh, or issues, the whole transgender bathroom thing, uh, uh, abortion restrictions, things like that. Do they spend too much time mm -hmm. on it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't really mean time. I mean, is it, 
does it eat up too much of the the legislative priorities? I mean, all of those are important issues for sure. I'm not really sure where you're going with the question, um, asking me if there's too much time. They're all important issues. I think um, the more important thing is the solution. Uh, so uh, how much time it takes to get to the solution really doesn't matter. Yeah, I, yeah it's less about, my question I guess is less about the time and more about priorities. Um, priorities. Like would you, you know, so back to hypothetical, you're in the ledge when the uh, bathroom bill is coming up. Mm -hmm. Where would you put on that? On the bathroom bill? Um, having gender neutral bathrooms? Or banning. I mean, I know I experienced it in my business, right? When I first opened my store, I was, I was required, because we opened in 2012, okay? And I was required to have a male and female restroom. And um, then, I'll admit, you know, I had some issues going on, personal issues, and then the law passed, and I, someone came in from the city and said that I was not compliant, and, I, and he said um, I had to take the male female signs off the bathroom. My first thought was, goodness, I wish that would have happened before because I wouldn't have had to spend the money on two bathrooms. <laughs> so in that way, I was pretty happy. I didn't see any issues with it. I, I've heard some people complain in regard to um, larger, I only had single use restrooms, so this was not an area where more than one person can be in there at a time. I've had, I've heard some people not comfortable with, you know, restrooms where there could possibly be a male and a female and there's younger children, things like that. Do I think that, I think they're honestly, I, I think I know where you're going. With, I think there are more important issues than that, honestly. Yeah, yeah I was, uh, the, the, in this know, world, the banning, the, you know, the, the <laughs> saying you have to uh, use the bathroom, whatever your birth assigned sex is. That was yeah, to and couple years ago. but when I say there are more important issues, I guess I wouldn't have spent so much time on that. If it's going to make people happy, I suppose, without severely uh, burdening business owners, I'm fine with the bill. It's it's really nothing life changed I guess it's life changing for the person that experienced it right that had the problem um, I, I just I never want to do something that um, you have to look at both sides I guess is what I'm saying you know there's people that are set in their ways and are comfortable in certain situations you know at the end of the day you want to do what's good for the, the greater good not Homelessness earlier, um, so the governor has gotten really involved. Yes, in he has gotten involved, and I'm and I'm happy. So, yeah, so uh, team Abbott or team Adler, like. What are you oh no! Saying? Look, like I said, I live downtown, and I've lived downtown um, for four years now, and I owned my business downtown since 2012. Over the years, I could clearly see things changing, as I. And I would address that with my daughter. She was part owner with me. And, you know, you could see the homeless situation. We didn't have it as bad as other people with homeless problems because my store was two blocks from the state capitol. We had a few issues. But um, I could see it getting worse and worse. And um, when I put my business up for sale... It took about eight months to sell it. We literally, uh, the ban was changed in July of last year, right? The deal for my business went through August 1. So there was one month where we, I still owned it. And I can tell you, from the day they changed that, it was night and day. And I remember looking at my daughter and saying, I wanted to sell the store, but I am really happy I sold the store now 
because I would not want to, as a business owner, I would not want to have to deal with that day in and day out. Literally within the first month, because I'm one of those people that spent a lot of money. Um, you know the parklet patios that they have? I, I was the second person to get a parklet patio. Um, although Austin permitting delayed it three years. <laughs> and that's another story. But um, um, I was the second person to get a parklet patio. And right after that ordinance passed, every morning, because I would go open the store, which I would get there at 6.30, 6, 6.30. Every morning I was having to move multiple homeless people from the front patio. The urine, um, the cardboard boxes, um, and literally, I'm not exaggerating, piles of human feces. It was very frustrating for me. I spent $75,000 on that patio, which for a little patio, that's a substantial amount of investment. Um, I quickly decided, I mean, I, the business was already, it was already a done deal, but I remember saying, I am so happy and thankful that this business is sold because I would not want to have to deal with this on a daily basis. Because the police could come and they're not really forced to leave. And, and then <clears throat> it was really interesting because um, when the city of Austin, when you get one of those parklet patios uh, and you go in and they explain all the permitting process, I do read all, everything when I'm signing my name to something because it's important to me. So I knew the rules very well. And unfortunately, I knew them better than the city of Austin did, so I was having to point out where they were wrong. But I do recall um, it was stated very clear when you had a parklet patio, I was not allowed to put a um, private property sign, anything along that. Um, it was it had to be open to the public, okay? I couldn't say, customers you can't only. custom my, my customers only. And I was okay with that because as I, when I uh, was talking to um, the team that designed it, I said, I want to make something that's beautiful for Austin that really adds some interesting architectural aspects not i want people to walk around here and feel like they're because the store was italian you know my parents are italian um i wanted them to feel like they were in italy so we wanted to have a bunch of flowers and i just really wanted to make it a nice place and i was okay with that because we even added um a nice bench around a tree that was a special uh, permit that we got so people could sit and read and gather and do all kinds of nice fun things i had no problem with that but when um i made the complaint um downtown austin alliance they the person that walks around and you know cleans up uh i asked them i say hey could you guys clean this up she called um her boss we must have spent 20 minutes with the boss going back and forth saying no, it's your, it's your property, it's private property. And I said, no, actually, it's not. Austin City it says it's not my property. I pay for it, but it's not private property. And the lady, as she was waiting, her boss finally came in person. Um, we spent 20 minutes talking, just she and I. And she said that literally from 6 to 8 in the morning, all she did was clean up human feces. That's all she did. That's an awful job for somebody. Um, he ended, her boss ended up coming out, and he said they would clean it that one time for me other than after that, as a favor. After that, it would be on me. You know, that's just not something a business owner should have to deal with on a daily basis. There's a better way to fix that problem. Pragmatic politics, heavily Democratic district, how does a Republican win it? How does a Republican win it? Well, if you look back at the history of this seat, um, I went back as far as 2008, and um, it's either been unchallenged or challenged by a libertarian. No offense to libertarians, but we all know that's political suicide. So um, it's won by someone like me. I'm pragmatic, reasonable, open to everyone, and um, well-educated, been a business owner. Um, I think... Uh, I think I have an opportunity. I think I have a chance to win this seat.
What votes or positions that the incumbent has supported would you go after that you think are wrong for the district? Oh, one thing that's top on my mind, she um, is opposed to campus carry. Uh, there's a lot of issues with homelessness right now in that area. There's some young girls that have literally gone through the same experiences as me, waking up to strangers inside their apartments. Um, taking guns away from people that want to protect themselves is never the answer to the problem. We need to stop with these personal recognizance bonds. The person that um, committed the first murder of the year was a homeless person, as Abbott suggested, had a long criminal history, and was in and out of jail. Never stayed in, I shouldn't even say in and out of jail, Got didn't have to uh, pay any money, used a personal recognizance bond, never pays anything, which is what that is, and they're free. They don't ever show up for their court date, and um, they're loose on the streets committing crimes. On campus carry, you have to have an LTC, used to be a CHL, to do that. You have to be 21 to do that. Most college students, large tract of college students are not 21. Would you lower the age so everybody could defend themselves on campus, or keep it at the age of 21? I personally think that someone 18, if they want to protect themselves, should be able to carry a gun. And for people that like to use the argument, well, you have to be 21 to drink, I would simply say ingesting a substance that's going to alter your perception is not the same as protecting yourself from harm. So you totally lower the age for uh, legal concealed or carry now to 18 statewide? I really don't see a problem with it because like I said, protecting yourself is far different than, I mean, soldiers go to war at 18. They're defending our freedom. I know that, uh, we all know that, you know, nor brain uh, isn't fully formed till the age of 24, 25. I mean, if we're gonna do, use that thought process, then why don't we make everything voting, Drinking, why don't we make everything 25 years old? Um, but protecting yourself is important. It is. I know that. I would want my daughter, if I had a daughter that was 18, I'd want her to protect. I tell you, I'd be the mom that was following her to class with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Cut down her dating opportunities, but it's fine. <laughs> we don't need to get into this. <laughs>